What's up, Resonate? Good to see you guys. Uh, a, few, uh, a few years ago, uh, my wife was training for a triathlon, and uh, we were on our way down to, uh, to New Mexico. And so um, because she wanted to continue to train even as we were traveling, um, we found a, uh, a place that had a pool that she could swim laps in. Um, but the difficulty was we were taking a kind of a pit stop in, in Salt Lake City, and, um, and I wanted to find a great deal. So I did find a great deal, but it was way out of the way. In fact, it was way up in the mountains uh, in Salt Lake City. Um, and so we drove, uh, we drove there, and uh, my wife, uh, you know, as we got checked in and we had our, our kids running around, it was this amazing place up in the mountains, and um, so she decided she was gonna swim a few laps. And so she gets into the pool, and, um, and <laughs> she starts swimming, and, uh, and I'm there uh, on, the, on the edge, and, and um, I, can, I can see that she's struggling, and so you know, I just keep, you know, come on, you can do it, Paige, you can do it. And, um, and she, at some point, just swims and swims and swims, and then she just like stops, and she's just heaving, breathing. She's like, what is wrong with me? And, um, and I'm like, I don't know, babe. Uh, maybe it's just the travel, something like that. So she swims a couple of laps. And again, she's like, this is so hard. And so then I lean down and say, you're at 9,000 feet. There's like 30% of the normal oxygen level. Um, and um, it was just like this, she was like, and then she splashed me and she said, why didn't you tell me? And why did you get a hotel here, right? Um, <laughs> And there was this, you know, fascinating moment as she's um, trying to do something she, uh, you know, she's, d you know, deciding to do and she's putting effort into it. And it seems like the amount of effort she's putting into it doesn't lead to the output she was expecting. And, uh, and when I think about where we're going to go and, and what this looks like, we, we talked at, at ResCon about this idea of being empowered and what it looks like to live out this, this Christian life. But there's these moments um, that really, as we begin to live this out, sometimes it feels incredibly difficult. And sometimes it feels like we are uh, moving into a place where there's just not an ox enough oxygen. There's not just not enough um, things that are sustaining us to lead to the output that we desire in our lives. And, and so I want to get into this, and we're going to be looking today at Romans chapter 5. And uh, so if you have your hop copy of Scripture, you can, you can turn that on or pull that out or however you read the Bible. Um, but what I think is going to be really key for us is going to be looking at the Scripture and being able to understand what it means to see if Jesus actually works. And so when we, when we get into this, this reality, I think the question is, uh, as we think about being empowered to something or if we think about what it looks like for Jesus to take and really manifest, the, the question is really, does Jesus work? And, um, and, and really, what does work? And, and, and in this, I want us to understand that God displays his power in us before he consistently displays his power through us. And so as we begin to think about this idea of, um, of being empowered to take the gospel to the places around us, um, what we have to do is we have to talk through what does it look like for us actually to sense God's power in us, for us to be able to experience that we are changed people and for us to be able to understand what that really means. And, and one of the most difficult things is that as we get into this, and as we begin to kind of pursue Jesus, there's a competing narrative that begins to kind of overlay onto what it looks like to follow Jesus. And what happens is I think that this creates a ton of confusion. And ultimately, as it creates a ton of confusion, it also, it, it also creates this just a lack of compelling storyline. And so the whole, we've talked about this, Christianity and the story of Christianity, the undeniable thing is that um, it is it is a group of people that were so radically changed that the world began to take notice of their lives. And so Christianity is a, is a people with a book and people with a story, and there's other religions that have books and stories. But the thing that Christianity has that no other religion has is it has a savior. And this savior says, hey, I'm going to take upon myself what is wrong with the world, and I'm going to fix that. And as he fixes that, Jesus, we begin to see something profoundly change, and this competing narrative just crumbles. But it's being propped up, and, and this competing narrative, as we look at this, is called moral therapeutic deism. And basically, this was a term that, um, that, that a couple of authors put together to describe how teenagers, about a decade ago, began to see their religion 
as this moral therapeutic deism. And, and basically this is, is kind of, it, it took this competing narrative of what it looks like to be a Christian. And what began to happen is this began to be kind of this, this way by which people understood their Christianity. And I would posit that it, would, it basically destroyed the very underpinnings of what Christianity is all about. And as it destroyed those things, it ultimately created a, 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 um, a storyline that basically said, hey, you, you just do whatever works for you, and you begin to do this, but it doesn't have an objective effect upon your life that is noticeable and tangible to the people around you. And so then it just became like another one of the narratives of our world that just says, okay, did you find something that worked for you? I'm so glad that that happened. So I want to walk through just what this means, this, these words, moral, m- that God wants people to behave and that good people go to heaven when they die. This is the this this is the thing that is, uh, is the competing narrative in Christianity that really what God wants people to do is just to be nice people and to behave and to be um, people that are kind to one another. And really what happens is that we begin to say, hey, if this is the kind of person that you are, then it's most likely that a loving, compassionate God will ultimately bring you into his presence forever. Then there's this therapeutic part that really God wants people to be happy and well-adjusted. And the central goal is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. And so if we want to be a good person, then good people go to heaven. And then ultimately to, to have some sort of a religion that is a, a self-help kind of thing, where it becomes something where you're trying to become well-adjusted um, to be happy and to feel good about yourself. And then ultimately this idea of the, some sort of a God, that he's made the world, but then he left it alone, that he's not really personally involved in the everyday lives of people, that God doesn't need to be particularly involved in life, except maybe when there's a problem. And so we compartmentalize mentalize God and we begin to say, okay, God, I'm going to just go ahead and live my life and it's going to look like everybody else. And it's just going to be this thing that gives me a little bit of a boost on the side. And it gives me a little bit of like, hey, I can do this. And, um, and I have God to be kind of my, my inspiration in life. And so I'm going to be a good person. I'm going to have an inspiring figure like Jesus. And I'm going to uh, you know, leverage God whenever there's moments. But it's not going to be the dominant storyline of my life. And it's not going to be the integrated thing in my life. And so here's what happens is that becomes kind of the normative of, of, of kind of how Christianity begins to play itself out and that we begin to see that this is, um, I would say, I would say, I would compare it to kale versus ibuprofen. So just go with me on this. Um, this idea, um, a few years ago, we discovered that kale was a superfood. We didn't know that there were superfoods until someone told us that kale was one of them. And so all of a sudden, we began to make all these smoothies, right? And that requires us to get better blenders. And so now we have better blenders to make our better smoothies. And so we don't have pieces of kale stuck in our teeth, right? And so this is this new reality, right? And so all of a sudden, everybody's you know, buying these clear, you know, clear um, glasses to make sure that you can see that they're drinking their kale, right? And so that they're good people. And so that we begin to bring these, um, you know, we bring it to work or whatever. And so we can see that I am, I'm a superfood fanatic, right? And so all of a sudden there's this, this reality that superfoods and kale begins to dominate and it begins to give us all these unknown things that no one can say, Hey, this is why kale is super, but we just think it is right. And so, and, and so it's one of those things that it begins to be, um, one of those, it just kind of works for me, right? And we don't really know why it works. And we don't really have, uh, you know, it's like, oh, definitely I can see from the outside. That is a kale drinker, really like, or a kale eater, whatever it is, right? No one can be able to say on a, on a lineup, I can take, I ain't going to pick the kale people from the non-kale people, right? And so there's this kind of reality that we begin to kind of think, oh, maybe this is just an inspirational life choice. On the other hand, no one would ever say that ibuprofen is an inspirational thing, right? No one would ever say, hey, have you heard? Have you heard the news about ibuprofen, <laughs> right? And no one would ever say, my pill box, I'm getting it out. I want everybody to see that I take ibuprofen, right? Such a strange thing. But it's just this functional reality, right? And when you have an ache and when you have something that's going wrong, you begin to say, I just need some ibuprofen. Why? Because it works. Because I was feeling achy and no longer am I achy. And so this is this reality that, uh, that I think that we begin to say, okay, does Jesus work? Is this actually functionally something that we can say is changed? Because when we began this thing, it wasn't an inspirational life choice because people were dying 
because they follow Jesus. It was a functional, I was like this, and I'm like this. It was like ibuprofen, right? And so in this, as we begin to talk about what it means for us to live empowered lives, does Jesus work? Is Jesus functionally changing the way that you live your life? And the things that are wrong in your life, is that being able to see the empowerment of Jesus in your life to change those things? Now, one of the problems is that moral therapeutic deism gets us into this place where we have this belief that, um, that all of a sudden kind of becomes this, uh, this underlying thing that we didn't really know that we needed. So uh, moral therapeutic deism basically says that it might not be true that Jesus is the only way to God, but he's one of the ways for God, and he's a very inspiring way to God. But if we don't understand that we need a savior, then we don't understand that there's something that needs saved within us. And in this, oftentimes what happens is that the underlying belief systems shifts to this reality that we believe that we are not a, uh, that we are a good person that occasionally does bad things. That, that fundamentally we're good people and we're trying to be better people right? And we're trying to be moral people and we're trying to be self-adjusted people. And we have this inspirational figure that's helping us to get that way. But ultimately we are good people that occasionally do bad things. And that idea means that we don't necessarily need a savior, which means that there's multiple ways to be able to get to God. And we just choose whichever way is a part of our culture or whichever way is our story or whichever way makes sense to us or the things that our friends do, right? And so all of those give us these multiple ways, so to speak. And so in this, if we believe fundamentally, all these things relate back to this idea that I'm fundamentally a good person, but just I, I make mistakes sometimes. I do bad things. Now, the thing is, you know, we, we would say is that, that you know, I'm, I'm a fundamentally a good person, but, but if we were to, you know, stand before God and he was to, to you know, ask why, why he should let us into heaven, we would say, well, fundamentally I'm a good person, but, but then we would use that phrase, but nobody's perfect, right? Well, nobody's perfect. We, we make mistakes. And this is, uh, this is how we get into these things that we typically think that we are good people. And, uh, and so here's the, here's the difficulty in this. When we begin to actually think about this and we begin to actually process it out, that idea just doesn't hold water. If we were to think about fundamentally I'm a good person, uh, the question is this, if you're an inherently good person, why can't you be a consistently good person? If you are inherently good, why can't you be consistently good? So if, if, this is, if, you're, if this is who you are, then why can't we consistently behave that way? If you're inherently good, then why aren't you consistently good? And here's, what's, you know, here's what we begin to, to process. Like, oh, well, I just make these mistakes, but I'm inherently good, right? And if, if that's the case, and if we were to actually to play that out, then <laughs> counseling would be incredibly easy, Right? Because if you're inherently good, then we just need to go to someone who tells us to stop. And we would go and we'd say, hey, here's the things that are um, you know, dysfunctional in my life. Here's the issues. And someone on the other side be, would say, hey, because you're a good person, I just need to inform you that you should stop doing those things. And you would hand them your, you know, your $100. And you would go off, right? And that would be the end of your time. Because you'd be able to have someone that clarified be, that because you're good, you're but that's not the way it happens, right? It's not the way it happens. And so, in fact, we get into these places, right, where we have these, these things where, man, we know that they're wrong, and we know that they're going to cause destruction, and it's happened before where we've experienced the consequences of this thing, but we, we, we do these things, and we do these things because we want to, we do these things because we have a desire to do this. And so here's the, here's the reality, right? You begin to, to go after this, and we begin to seek this, and we know those things would get us into trouble, and so we continue, but we continue to do things. And the problem is, is that we are not good people that sometimes do bad things, that at our fundamental nature, we are sinners who occasionally do good things. 
We are people that fundamentally have from the very core of us a nature to sin, and we continue to go after this even when we know the consequences because our desires are for those sinful things. Now, I know that you're really excited about hearing this, right? This is such a great day to come to church when you begin to hear these things like this. But I remember um, we had a dog um, a few years ago, and our dog was a six-pound dog. Um, it was a Yorkshire Terrier, and we would you know, put this dog on a leash, and every now and then that dog would have this wild hair about what it wanted to go and do. And it would, like, it would know that it was on a leash, but it would take at you know as fast as those little two and a half inch legs could take it. It would go run towards this thing, and every single time something would happen, we would get to the end of the rope of the leash, and this six pound dog would just go 100 miles an hour right to the end, and then it would you know that leash would round her, her neck. It would elevate her, spin her around. And she would land back the other way, right? Because somehow the desire overpowered the knowledge that she was about to get clotheslined by her, uh, by her own leash. And this would happen over and over. And if you've ever walked a dog, you understand what it means for you to be wrapped around like a pole or a tree. And that dog cannot figure out what is going on, right? And you're trying to unwrap the cable and you're trying to figure out how to do it. And it's like... Seriously, dog, come on. Come around. Don't you understand that you've just wrapped yourself twice around this pole, you know, and I'm trying to get you to go the opposite, and they can't figure out what's going on and why you're getting to them to go around the pole in the opposite way, right? It makes no sense. And that's a little bit like us and our sin nature that, that God is helping us to move towards this, and we can't figure out, but we continue to go back and do this all over and over. Oftentimes what we think is I'm just making a mistake, right? And we're not making a mistake, right? A mistake is when you add wrong. A mistake is not when you decide to have an affair, right? When you decide I'm going to try to hide this and go, like, a mistake is when you move, don't move the decimal in the right place, right? A mistake is not when you choose to violate, um, you know, uh, the depth of your um, core values and what is in the, in the Bible, in this, as we begin to say, um, here's, here's what it looks like. We know even from the very beginning of our lives, right? This is just our fundamental nature. This is just how, and, and if you don't know that, um, then you need to be around kids. And, and, and for those of you who have kids, you understand this really, really key, right? You understand that, um, that you don't have to say, hey, today what we're going to do, um, we're going to learn how to disrespect mom. Let me give you a few phrases. Here, try this one on. Um, this, will, this will work. You don't ever have to say, okay, um, gather around the table. Today, selfishness. We're going to learn selfishness. And this is how you take your stuff and, you know, you say mean things to the people around you. You know, we don't ever have to say, um, okay, Here's how to hit. If they don't do something to you, you just take and you sock them, right? We don't, no one has to help understand how to do this, right? Fundamentally, right? We allow, I mean, we just see this happen over and over and over. And so in this, the first thing that we have to understand is that when it comes to in the empowering reality of who God is, we have to understand where we're at. The first rung on the spiritual ladder for us to get to a place where we understand how Jesus works is to understand our need for a Savior and to understand what's going on and to understand that our moral therapeutic deism that helps us try harder will never get, get us to a place that really succeeds and we begin to display the power of God in our life where other people can begin to say, hey, there's something different. And we'll always be incrementally better, just a, a somewhat better version of our same self. And I hope that you don't want to be the incrementally better version of your same self. I hope that in you, you begin to lean in and say, if this, is G, if this Jesus thing is right, then there's a, there's a hope that's far greater than an incrementally better version of myself. And so all of this sets up where we're going for the next four weeks. And for us to talk about what it means to actually have the power of God in our inner life to be able to combat and be able to do the things that God's created us to do, that we begin to see how he begins to change who we are. So in Romans 5, verse 6, it says this. You see, at just the right time, when we were still 
powerless. Now, I want you to get this because I set up that whole beginning to be able to, to help us to understand that if you don't recognize your powerlessness over the sin and over the nature that is within you, then you will ultimately you will spend your time and your effort trying to work through and white knuckle the kind of person that you want to be. And you'll try to do something after something after something. And ultimately, out from the outside, it'll just look like you have something that's somewhat inspiring to you. But ultimately, it's not changing you. And I want you to get that if we don't understand the powerlessness that we have, then this is where we begin to see that, um, th- that this is not going to actually change us. And what I hate is when people begin to believe that they are following Jesus and yet they are not actually being changed because they don't understand the gospel. And so a- a- eventually they begin to say, I guess it doesn't work or it's not very compelling, or I'll just stay here because I found community, but I didn't actually see a change in the core of who I am, which is the hope of Christianity, that Christ in you, the hope of glory, right? And for you to be able to have something that you begin to say, okay, this is actually what it means to follow Jesus. And I would say if you've not experienced that, then there's a massive piece of Christianity that you have not fully understood because this is the promise of what God gives in us, that while we were yet powerless, powerless to say, of ourself, it says this, that Christ died for the ungodly. Again, here's that place when we begin to say you're powerless, you are ungodly, and you're like, I didn't know if I thought I was, I was that bad, right? And then we begin to see in verse 8, let's skip down one, it says this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Said this, for if while we were God's enemies, again, so you, you just heard that you were powerless, that you were ungodly, you are enemies. Like there's some phrases here that if you have moral theor- therapeutic deism as somewhere living in the way that you understand God, that you're missing out on understanding. If you don't get to the place where you understand, hey, I, I'm not a good person who fundamentally or sometimes does good things. I'm fundamentally a sinner, a natural born sinner that sometimes does good things. And when we get to, get to that point, we begin to see the good news emerge from this. We were reconciled to him through the death of his son. And how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? And this is this, this, is this amazing thing that we begin to think about, um, you know, as you begin to think, uh, let's go back to this. But God demonstrates this, his own love and while, we're, while we were still sinners, right? Not while we were sinning, but while we were sinners, this understanding of our identity, this is key as we, when we begin to get to the place where this actually changes, that you understand there's an identity shift. And that identity shift has to start out with you begin to understand, hey, I'm a sinner. And this is where we begin to, uh, to believe this and understand that God is telling us something that is way deeper than just our actions. That you came into this world destined to do bad things. And this is your nature, right? So in this, this is why we have both laws and policemen. Because if that wasn't our nature, all we would need is laws. We would just say, here's what's right. Here's what we should do. But because in our essence of who we are, we are sinful people, we also need policemen. So you're not consistently good because you're not inherently good. And so therefore, these mistakes, these things that we begin to look in this, we begin to say, okay, this is, what, this is what I begin to move towards this, and I do this reflexively. I don't try to do this. I know it's not who I want to be. And if I do this, and you were to ask me, why did you do this? Is that what you desire to do? You'd say, no, I didn't desire to do that. I didn't want to do that. But this is how I begin to act. And so in this, it says this, therefore, Just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in the same way death came to all people because all sinned. So what we begin to see in this is Adam, he was the first human being. Adam had this incredible relationship with God, um, but Adam chose against God. And we weren't there, we weren't born. And so, but in this, 
This decision he made affects all of us. His decision to turn away from God made us by nature enemies of God's. And so we're sinners at odds with God. There's something in us that is from the very beginning uh, fundamentally rebellious against who God is. And that something happened at the core of his being that changed. And all of us that come from Adam are affected by that decision. You may say this is incredibly, incredibly unfair. That his decision affects us. And I would say you're absolutely right. That this is incredibly unfair. That we have this nature in us because of a decision that would preceded us. But this is just true. And this is what it is. This is like a, a, friend, a, a friend of mine, a former staff member uh, of Resonate Church, uh, a, few, a few years ago adopted um, two little boys, one of which um, his, his mom had done drugs um, while she was pregnant for him. And, uh, and if you look at his brain scan uh, against a normal, uh, a normal kid's brain scan, there's just something fundamentally different that he did not choose. And that he has issues and he's working through those issues, but it wasn't because he made that choice, but because of something that someone else chose. It's not fair, but it is true. And this is that truth that lives within us. And what we begin to see is that this is how this entered the world and death came to all people. It says this, to be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given. But sin was not given to the, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. So basically it's saying this, hey, the nature was there. And what happens is to extract out this need for a savior and to be able to show us this, the law was given. And the law clarified really what was inside of us, right? So in this entire narrative of the Bible, what God is leading up to is beginning to reveal the savior that is going to change everything for all time. But that need has to be revealed because that, that sin nature has to be shown in its entirety. And so in that law being given to be able to say, hey, this is the standard. And when people did not meet that standard, it revealed what was in them and revealed what needed to be a savior. Now, the difficulty in our day and age is that the ambiguity of objective truth is one of those things that leads us to say, I maybe I'm not a bad person. Right? Maybe, maybe it's not something that I, I mean, I just kind of make mistakes because there's like this, this goal that I want to be in my life. But, but that idea of law is being kind of eroded in our world. And so there's not the clarity sometimes of saying, hey, I need something that is beyond me. And this is what we begin to see in scriptures is we begin to see this difference between what it means to be in Adam and what it means to be in Christ. So this is... This is this idea that we were in Adam, right? And that being in Adam, that was that clarity of really what it looks like for us to operate out of this sinful nature. And this sinful nature is one of those things that is just woven in us. But then what we begin to see Paul outlining is this idea that there's another option to this, and that is being in Christ. And that as we begin to see these two things, there's two fundamental identities that we begin to grasp. So therefore, if we begin to see this, it says this, but the gift of salvation is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Now here's here's this idea that, and, and And if you have your copy of scripture and you can highlight it or the idea of how much more is really key there because it says this, that if this thing was messed up in Adam, then when Christ comes, there is a grace that is dispensed that overcomes all of the things that messed us up in Adam, that what Adam messed up, Christ fixed up. And in this, there is a new opportunity now that you can go from being in Adam to being in Christ. And this is that key understanding of the change of identity. It says this, nor can the gift of God 
be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment that followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift that followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespasses of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. This is, this is this mind-blowing thing, right? If we begin to say, okay, it's clear that my identity is in Adam and that in Adam I bear the result of the fall and I bear the result of a nature that fights and rebels against God, that I am not a good person that inherently makes, or that, that makes mistakes, but I'm inherently a bad person that sometimes does good things now, if that's the case, then there's something that happens. And what Jesus does is he takes the sin of, the, of, of mankind in his life and his death and resurrection takes and brings us out of that identity and places us into the identity of Jesus. And we now have the, the, the fundamental posture towards sin that Jesus had towards sin. And here's what that looks like, that we would reign in life that not we would survive in life, not that there would be an inspiration towards better life, not that this would be the equivalent of kale in life, but this is one of those things that would be talking about rain in life because of the grace and the gift of righteousness. That here's what we begin to see, that we were in Adam, but now we are in Christ. And that being in Christ now is a new fundamental identity at our very nature, and this is so cool because what we begin to see is this, that at the level of your being, that not only did Christ have the power over your destiny, that the power over your will has been changed too. That we can talk about sometimes, hey, follow Jesus because it affects all of your eternity. But the other thing that we miss sometimes is to follow Jesus because it, it has an effect over the will that you have. It, it has an effect in who you are. It has an effect in how you operate. And that this is so amazing that the power of sin has been broken in your life. That you, uh, man, you, you know that you've experienced these things that lead to death. You can look at these realities of, of addiction. You can look at these realities of, man, I, I do what I don't want to do. And you can begin to understand that death is this reality, that death do all kinds of things. And we understand that this is the, the effect of sin in our lives. And yet we have the power in Christ to be able to say, not, not my primary, primary identity is like, I want to do these things. Now, this is really key that you begin to say, well, God wants me to be this kind of person, but I want to do these things. Now, when you are out of Adam and in Christ, you can begin to say, hey, sin wants me to do those things, but my fundamental nature and posture is to be in Christ. Does that make sense? That at one point we begin to say, okay, that's what God wanted me to do. That's what God wants, right? And I have a choice to be able to do what God wants me to do. And that's where shoulds and shame and guilt lives. Now we begin to say, okay, now I am fundamentally in Christ. My new identity, my new nature is there. And now the temptation is that sin wants me to do these things, wants me to use my body in these ways, wants me to be lassoed back to this, wants me to be in bondage, wants me to, to, to think that somehow that I am a, I, I'm somebody who has these desires and I have to acquiesce to those desires. So this, this is the key for you to be able to understand that this is your new nature. And as you begin to understand this, it begins to change everything forever. And so we see people who tell stories of being transformed and maybe they record their story. And, um, and the question is, are they responding to crisis or Christ? Is this something that just, hey, this is a, a, a time in my life when, uh, when I just need something profound? Or are they actually being changed in their very identity and being able to say, I'm not who I was anymore? And so this reigning in life, like this is the key for us to be able to say, what does it look like for us to be people who reign in life? 
What does it look like for us to be people who actually believe we can see the power of our will being transformed in this, in this kind of way? And, and as you begin to get this and you begin to understand that you are not a good person that needs to do better, you're a sinner by nature who is a slave to sin and needs to be set free. Needs to be set free. So what does it look like? for us to be able to see this. So if we think about moral the- therapeutic deism, this is I have a bad habit, I can do it, I can dis- d- discipline myself to do better, I can modify my behavior, I need help, I need an example, I need support, I need motivation and inspiration. A- and unfortunately, this is leaked into the Christian church and this idea that many people still carry in their heads on how they practically every day begin to live out the will, uh, how, the, how they live out the decisions that their will causes them to have to confront. Here's what Christianity says. I'm powerless to change my nature, my heart. My behavior comes from my heart. Modifying my behavior is a struggle because it doesn't deal with my heart. A moral clarity won't make me into a good person. A good example won't be enough to change my heart. Inspiration or motivation starts the process, but it doesn't sustain it. And so here we are. We go and you see um, Paul. He says this in Galatians, and Galatians and Romans are kind of this, Galatians is like this cliff notes of Romans. So this is kind of this extended narrative of this. It says, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life that I now live in the body, this is here and now, this is not just talking about when I die. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So this, there's a real clear understanding of what it means to make a decision, right? That I no longer live. That Adam and who Adam was is no longer alive. This is no longer me. This is no longer at a soul level how I operate. And what is it? It said, the life that I live, I live by faith in the Son of God, and that is a who, right? Not just a what, it is a who. And when we begin to live towards a who, it begins to say, it is Christ who lives in me. And again, so now we have, if it's Christ who lives in me, I have the same orientation to sin as Christ has towards sin. And if we remember what Christ did, he died and resurrected to break the bondage of sin. And so the resurrection of Jesus is now available to us to be able to say, this is how I begin to live out because of Christ in me. And so in this, here's what we begin to look at. We begin to see this reality of this idea of letting grace reign in our life. Letting grace reign. If you go just a couple of uh, phrases or a couple of verses down in the end of Romans chapter 5, he uses this phrase, It says, may grace reign in you. Now, here's why I think that those three words are key. Is that for you, as you begin to understand your world, and you begin to understand, so if we were to say, let God reign in your life, oftentimes we can begin to think, hey, from the perspective of Adam, God wants me to do this, and I need to let God reign. But there's this moment that happens when we begin to fundamentally understand grace and we understand grace in terms of the forgiveness that's available to us and the capacity to live towards Christ. I remember as a, um, the second semester of my junior year in college, um, I was just, I was just captured by sin. There was just some stuff that was going on in my life where, um, Man, I was, I was preaching as a college student in churches around the area, and I was speaking, I was, I was teaching other college students, leading a Bible study uh, at a church, leading a, leading a ministry on, on campus. And at the same time, man, I was, I was deeply in bondage to sin. And I just, I couldn't get out of it. I, I tried everything I, I could to be able to figure out how do I get out of sin? 
And I remember one day, it's just like something, just something switched. As I was reading the text and I was looking at this, it began to clearly help me understand. Man, I'd been a Christian for a long time, but I'd been a Christian that had never fully understood the difference between being, having identity in Adam, where there was some stuff that I knew that God wanted me to do, and I was trying to do what God wanted me to do. And being able to understand that I'm in Christ, and my identity is in Christ, and grace began to reign in my life, and I began to say, that's not me. That's not me is, the, is who God is indwelling in. Those things, that's not me. So it's fundamental, fundamentally not my identity to engage in those things, to be able to give in to the temptation of those sins. And what happened, this is not how it's always happened in my life, but at that moment, it just shifted. And my desire and my temptation it was one of those moments that it was just so clear that, that, that this was an identity and a new identity, but it, that it was just like those things became absolutely, just the desire left me immediately. The desires for those things. And it was just this incredible thing, but it came out of this understanding of what it means and what does this look like. And so let me give you one last thing to be able to talk through and to be able to say, what does it look like? As we begin to see this, I want you to get, this is just, if, if you're around Resonate, like for more than two minutes, we're going to swat something. So we're just going to analyze something through this strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat. Um, our staff, there's just, they're just kind of puking a little bit uh, as they see this, right? Um, but I want you to get, this is helpful. Um, as we begin to think about um, these weaknesses, and these strengths, right? And this is sin, and this is sin nature, and this is Christ, and we begin to see, man, there's some stuff that we get stuck in. And these are opportunities and threats. These are, these are things that happen. Opportunities might be the potential that you want. And the threats might be the things that you feel like you're just in bondage to or things that are happening in your life. But these are exterior to you. And so there might be some places where you're like, man, there's sin and there's some issues in my life. And that's creating this failure. You might be able to be like, hey, I want to be to become this person. I see this idea of who I should become. And maybe this is like this frustration, right? This is who I am. I want us to understand that we have the power as we change our identity to move from the idea of being an Adam to being in Christ. And as we begin to do this, these frustrations, they begin to turn into breakthroughs. And these failures, they begin to turn into battles. But here's how it happens. It's when we begin to use the idea that begins to be implanted into our hearts that we are going to let grace reign. That our identity is now not that, uh, that, that our nature has been changed. And sin is not a part of that. That desire is a foreign invader into our heart. And now as that desire is a foreign invader into our heart, because I'm letting grace reign, the identity of Christ begins to be more and more actualized and realized. And it begins to change who we are. And we can begin to say, sin, you don't get to have that. Sin, you don't get my mouth today. Sin, you don't get my eyes. Sin, you don't get my feet. You don't get my hands. Sin, you don't get my mind, right? This is some of those things because I'm found in Christ. This is the identity. I'm going to let grace reign. And when you begin to say, I'm going to let grace reign so that I I can begin to reign in life and I can begin to experience the power internally that allows me to have the power externally in my life. That it begins to start with you being changed and me being changed because we've begun to say, hey, no longer am I going to live in frustration because in Christ I can begin to see breakthrough. No longer am I going to live in failure because when I begin to let grace reign. And when I begin to understand, hey, I've been, I'm powerless on my own, but in Christ I'm made new, that I've been crucified and now a life of faith I begin to live. And so what does it look like for you to begin to even just uh, out the phrase and begin to say, sin, you don't get to. If you will even just start saying that out loud. If we begin to say, I'm, I'm going to let grace reign. I'm telling you, it's going to sound weird for you to say those things out loud but it begins to help you to externalize what is internalized and help you to believe who you are. And for you to be able to say, sin, you don't get to. Now for you to wake up and I'm gonna let grace reign. That God has already made me in his image. That God has already won the battle. 
that he's made me into his image. I've been crucified. The old me is gone. The new me comes. So we're going to get more into this. If you're like, hey, I'm not sure if that was enough answers. I promise you, that's why this is a four-week series and not just a one-week series. So come back. We're going to be, gonna get to explore more of who God's created us to be in this hearty, meaty part of Romans.